Hello, everyone. Welcome again. This is the first day of Peralta Online Equity Conference, and I'm excited to introduce the presenter of the upcoming session, Keisha Jones from Davidson Davy Community College and also North Carolina um, Community College System. Uh, and is it student center success, right? Yeah, you don't, you know, I'm going to do part of that as my introduction, so you don't have to spend a lot of time talking okay. about me. Good. And Keisha will talk about empowering change within um, the crucial role of self-work in DEI efforts. So uh, very excited to listen to her. But before that, before we start, I would like to remind you that you can use a Zoom captioning uh, feature by um, using the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. So you can turn it on and off uh, as you wish. And also please um, use the chat for your questions. I'm happy to share them with our presenter at the end of Session. And also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you will find the link in the chat. So um, you can find videos from last year and the previous year. This is a fourth year of Peralta Online Equity Conference. So you can have access to all recordings from previous conferences. So if you're all ready, let's turn to our presenter for her speech. Keisha, microphone is yours. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're located. Um, I am in North Carolina, so it is three o'clock here. So most of my day is almost gone. It's almost time to go home. So nonetheless, I am Keisha Jones. I am um, the vice president of student affairs and chief diversity officer at Davis and Davy Community College. But I also give a portion of my time um, to our North Carolina Community College system under the North Carolina Student Success Center as the state equity director. Um, which means I provide um, support related to DEIB for all 58 community colleges in North Carolina, um, whatever that may look like for them. And so today I'm going to be talking to you all about the self-work pieces of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. I add the B because I think that that's something that we don't talk a lot about when we think about this work and we think about this space. Um, but you create a sense of belonging from the point in which somebody starts interacting with your organization. So I think that's a added letter that we need to discuss. So as we jump into the presentation today, I'm going to um, talk about, you know, that, but I'm also going to give you all some opportunities to engage in the chat with me. Um, because it is might right be right after lunch for people or right when you're eating lunch. So give you some opportunities to engage. But before I start, just kind of talking about rules of engagement as we are having dialogue, may it be you coming off mute or even in the chat. One thing that I don't think I'm capable of really creating is a safe space. I know we like to use that terminology a lot and say, hey, I wanna create a safe space. Um, instead, I use terms like brave space. And the reason why I use different languages because in order to create psychological safety for someone, which we're going to talk a little bit about when we're talking about this self-work, you have to know those people and you have to understand what safety is for them because safety for each person is different and what that looks like is different. So for me as a speaker coming in, I can't necessarily create psychological safety based off of the things that we're going to talk about. But what I hope I can do is create um, or a safe space. Um, my hope is that I can create a brave space where we still are listening actively. We're not interrupting. We're understanding that people come and are speaking from their own experiences, that we have experienced different things and that impacts the way that we operate and interact and engage with people, that we are willing to learn new perspectives and be tra as transparent as we can in our conversations that we're having. So that's kind of giving you an idea of creating that brave space instead of a safe space. It's still very similar, but definitely presenting it in a different way. As we're going to consider as you're taking notes um, and as we're just talking through what it's like to do that self-work and do that eye work that we need to do as a part of this, these are things that we should really, I want you all to be thinking about as personal growth and awareness as we're working through the session. So first, really think about a time when you felt like an outsider or excluded in a particular setting. How did that make you feel, right? 
How do stereotypes and assumptions affect your perception of others and your interactions with them? You know, do are there certain stereotype assumptions that you might have lived by? And being honest and transparent about that. I think we like to operate as perfect people. Um, and uh, the church that I go to, when you walk in, it says no perfect people allowed, right? Because we're not perfect. And we do um, have certain ways that we may have thought or behave and it's about being honest and being transparent. That's where that self-awareness and that self-reflection comes when you're doing this work. And it's very important for you to do that as you're doing this work, because when you're having conversations with people and you're trying to create those safe spaces versus those brave spaces, that's when you do want to be transparent to people so that they don't feel that, hey, I can't I can't tell you how I feel about a particular thing because they feel like you're perfect and you never experience anything. But those aren't things that we really think about all the time. And then the third thing I want you all to kind of think about as we're working through the workshop is how has your cultural background shaped your values and perspectives and how does it impact the way that you interact and engage with people? So before we jump into the session, I am going to put you all into groups. Um, I think it's very important for you all to take time to get to know people and learn about other people, especially when you have people that are coming from different spaces and places that you may never talk to or see ever again, but you may have the opportunity to learn from them. So at Davis and Davy, and in my work that I do across the state, there's something that I embed either as an icebreaker or um, just as an activity as a whole in some of my work, and it's called the culture wheel game. The culture wheel game is basically diversity, inclusion, and belonging in action. It has taken the time to get people, get to know people in a way that we wouldn't normally get to know people. If you think about your interactions, maybe you go to a conference or if you're at something at your job or even something personal, you know, a lot of times depending on our relationships with people, it dictates the level of conversation that we have and the types of questions that we ask. But what we don't realize is the more as you get to know people and the more you get to better understand who they are, the perspectives that they have, the things that they've experienced, the easier it is to better understand why they may respond the way they respond or why they may feel about certain things the way that they feel or wh why they may have certain views. And a lot of times it's the, I guess the discourse or disagreement really comes from a lack of understanding one another. So I always play this culture wheel game. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you all in breakout groups. You all will not be in there for a very long time. But what I want you to do is I want you to take some time. I want you to get to know the partner that you have in the room. You're going to ask, um, state your names, your role, the institution that you're um, working at and the location. And then there are different topics that you can talk about. What I'm putting in the chat now is um, the directions so that you don't have to try to remember what's on my slide while you are in your rooms. The form has more options that you can talk about outside of what you may see on this screen. Um, the first one would be on food where you may talk about different foods that are part of your culture or part of your identity. Other are traditions. If you didn't have trad traditions growing up, what are traditions that you may have um, implemented as you have grown and may have children or words or phrases? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you um, in groups. You all are going to stay in your groups for about five minutes. I'm not going to make them big groups because I want you all to have the opportunity to be able to um, dialogue with one another. But hold on. All right, so I'm going to send you to your groups now. And the instructions again are on the document that I put in the chat. If you haven't gotten your notification for your room, just let me know. I'm trying to make sure everybody got somebody in their room to talk to.
I see that um, room three had one. Oh, okay. I think he left. Yeah, I moved, I moved him to another room. Oh, good. Okay. Hey, so everybody. All right. So everybody is coming back and you all have met someone new. I hope you all met someone new. And how did that feel? Somebody either unmute yourself or drop in the chat. How did you all um, like the activity that you did? Or uh, you can give me an emoji. So thank you for the heart, David. That was wonderful. Um, and the, the conversation, I mean, the uh, conversation starters that you had were, were just, you know, they were low stakes, they were nice, and you could, re you could really relate to your partner. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this is an activity that I embed in a lot of the workshops that I do, but specifically in my campus workshop. Um, I mentioned we have, um, I lead the equity work here at Davidson Davy as the chief, di as chief diversity role, as just a part of my VP role. But we have what we call equity champions and equity champions are people on campus that have said, hey, this work is important to me. I wanna be a part of the bigger picture. How can I get involved? And so we meet with them every month and we do what we call capacity building where we do a lot of self work and a lot of self reflection with them. Uh, but this game right here, I had stopped playing with them because we had been playing it for a while. And when I stopped, they was like, well, where, why aren't we doing this? Because every time they learned something new about one of their colleagues, they learned a little bit more about themselves and how just taking that extra time to get to know someone and better un understand someone, um, especially in this work. This work, especially in 2024, is better, very political. It is very um, uncomfortable for some people. And so you have to take time to kind of get a, a placeholder and understanding of who people are and why they show up the way that they show up. So that's an easy way of doing it. And like you said, someone mentioned it's very low stakes, but it definitely takes us out of the, hey, my name is Keisha. I work here and this is what I do. And this is how long I've been here and really expand that conversation a little bit more and really get to know your colleagues. So jumping right into the self-work and really talking about what are the things that we can do ourselves. I am a true believer that you cannot have impact in a space or um, really push efforts, especially related to something like this, if you haven't done some self-reflection. If you haven't done what I like to say is check yourself. You can't check somebody else if you haven't checked yourself, like really taking that time and truly understand who you are and how you up in the spaces in which you show up on a regular basis. A joke I make all the time about myself is I am very direct. I, smiling is not my ministry. I do not walk around smiling every day. It is just not a part of who I am, but I'm very aware of that. And I also understand sometimes um, how that may impact the environment I am in. The key to the work, the key to things is really um, being self-aware and owning your stuff, right? And just being honest about who you are again and how you show up and how that impacts everybody else around you. It's not to necessarily say that I'm gonna walk around smiling all the time, but I also am conscious of it and I'm aware of it and how it impacts my environment and even some of the conversations that I may be having because me not smiling to somebody could mean that I don't understand what they're saying or I'm not processing. And so I try to implement and embed things in my day to day to try to address that. So really get into that place. This workshop is all about you taking some time and doing some stock on yourself, right? One of the activities that I recommend that people do in leadership roles or just from a personal perspective perspective is a SWOT analysis, right? When you think about a SWOT, ana a SWOT analysis, a lot of times we do it from a business perspective, but the business does a SWOT analysis so that they can really take stock of where they are as an organization and how they can grow and how they can thrive and what may be potential harm that may come to that business. You should operate in that same fashion, right? You should know what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your opportunities are, what your threats are, and how does that impact the work that I'm doing in the space that I'm in, may it be DEIB or other spaces, right? Especially, again, diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging conversations can be 
controversial, they can be political, they can be uncomfortable. There are so many things that could happen when you're having these conversations, especially if you potentially have someone that is kind of resistant to the converse, resistant to the conversation, not fully aware of the conversations and where they lead and what that means for them and their role. And so you have to be able to make sure that you don't get emotionally charged or you kind of understand what your triggers are so that you don't derail the conversation by not ensuring that you've kind of taken some stock of self. So in thinking about those basic things that we should be thinking of, one of the things, and you will see throughout this session, I will um, post a question, and this is really not for anybody to answer out loud, but really for participant engagement. As I'm talking, you can kind of put things in the chat, but what kind of self work have you engaged in in your journey? And I apologize for the typo, but what type of things have you engaged in, in your journey, I, you know, you can start putting that stuff in the chat. So in thinking about things that we really should think about, first, let's talk about language, right? Um, language plays a critical role in the self-work for several reasons. Um, when we think about diversity and inclusion, our words are powerful too. Sometimes they can be our mirror, a mirror to, a, to our commitment to respect and valuing every individual. So it's important to understand that language that we're using is inclusive, that we're choosing our words wisely so that everyone feels that sense of belonging, right? I mentioned that I, I added a B to my work. So it's, for me, it's not just diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's about belonging because you create a sense of belonging from the point in which someone starts having interest in your organization, right? That can be in the community, that can be on a billboard, that can be in the grocery store, that could be on a shirt and somebody that you see someone out on the street in, right? It could be your website, it could be so many things. So when you're thinking about creating that sense of belonging and even in the self-work that you're doing, you have to make sure that the language that you're using is creating that space that is inclusive and people feel like they belong. Um, other things, when you're thinking about reflecting on awareness, our choice of words can speak volumes about how well we understand the principles of DEIB. One of the biggest mistakes I think sometimes we make is that we're not clear on what we mean by the things that we say in this space. We don't define language for everyone. We don't understand. We don't try to create spaces where people are on the same page as it relates to the language, right? So what do these words mean? What do they look like in action on, on our campus or within our organization? So really kind of taking that time to make sure that we're reflecting on that, right? And understanding that we're all on the same on the same playing field or at least trying to get people on the same playing field. So when you think about the work and you think about yourself and how you operate in the work, what language are you using? Are you creating that foundational space that everybody is on the same page as you? Because I think sometimes as educators, we like to speak in high levels, right? We like to speak um, education talk and sometimes regardless of the space or place that a person came from, they may not be able to be on the same page. They may not be well versed in this area or in this space. So we have to make sure that we are creating that space and being self-aware enough to recognize that. We're all, we should always be promoting respect from a language perspective. So inclusive language goes just goes beyond just being kind. It's about affirming that dignity in the spaces where we speak and recognizing and celebrating the differences of other people. Uh, enhancing, enhancing our communication. We're providing clear and thoughtful language when we're having our interactions, when we're leading this work because it brings about stronger relationships and teamwork. And then we're challenging biases, right? So every time we choose our words, we have a chance to challenge biases both in ourselves and in others. So being critical about examining the language that we're using and trying to actively use inclusive language as much as we can. Other things that we should kind of think about is, you know, unconscious bias. This isn't about deliberate discrimination. It's about the automatic assumptions that we make about people based on their race, their gender, their age, and other facets of those people. And sometimes these biases are often invisible to us, yet they can significantly influence our decisions and how we respond to people and how we treat people, right? So again, taking that opportunity to do some self-reflection and really think about like, what are those implicit biases that I have? What are those stereotype assumptions that I may have lived by, by that, you know, I'm working on or I have worked on and I no longer, you know, engage in those spaces, but it, 
it's just that it's unconscious, right? It's a, it's an unconscious thing. So sometimes when it shows up, you're not always fully aware. So taking that time to kind of really sit through and think about what are some of those implicit biases that we may, or in, unconscious biases. The other is around stereotypes. Stereotypes are those oversimplified ideas we have about groups of people. They're like shortcuts that our brains use, but they're not an accurate reflection of those individuals and the complexity of those individuals, right? So relying on stereotypes can lead us to make unfair judgments. That's why, again, it's important. What are some of those stereotype assumptions that you may have lived by in the past or heard about or and show up on a regular basis, not on a regular basis, but from time to time in your life now? And it's something that you know that you need to work on. Microaggressions. Microaggressions are those things that people like to say are subtle, often unnoticed comments or actions that can really be hurtful to people, right? They're usually not intended to harm anyone, but they send a negative message based on that person's identity. So recognizing those things and understanding when we see those things and even being a voice when you've heard some someone use a microaggression, right? Getting to a place of being able to recognize those things to avoid perpetuating those things. And then allyship is, stream, is extremely important. Being an ally means actively supporting groups that face systemic disadvantages. So it's about using your own positions of privilege to advocate for equity. We all have some level of privilege. If I think about my role and I think about what I do at my institution, I, wait, I work at a predominantly white institution. I'm the only administrator of color at my institution. And so for me, when I think about positionality and I think about privilege, I'm in a position where I have to use my voice sometime when, sometimes when people feel like they have been mistreated or they've been microaggressed or something has happened. Um, a lot of times I'm the person that our students of color or employees of color feel like they can come and talk to that is a safe space. And so for me, I don't want to sit on that. I want to be able to utilize my voice and use my positionality that I have as the only administrator of color at my institution to be able to help those that are in my space, right? So recognizing where you have areas of privilege and utilizing that to support and help those individuals that may not have that same level of privilege. So those are some basic things when you're thinking about self-work. Now we're gonna really go into like the context of why it matters and then strategies and things like that. So my second question I have that you can put in the chat is, could you reflect on a personal growth area that you like to improve upon in the context of DEIB or within the broader workplace environment? So if you can drop that in the chat and you all can kind of engage with each other based off of that. So why does self-work matter? Why does all of this matter? And I kind of mentioned it in the beginning. I think it is very important that we check ourselves before we try to go out here and do anything else with anybody. Right. I, I wholeheartedly feel as if if we do not understand who we are, how we show up and how those two things impact the way that we interact and engage with people, we can derail this work. We can put people in spaces where they feel like they don't want to engage. They do not want to have conversation. Um, you want to be able to create safe spaces where people feel like they can um, be transparent and really talk about their feelings from an honest perspective, whether they agree with you or not, especially if you're leading this work. And even if you're not leading the work, right? I think that I can implement all the strategy on my campus. I can say, hey, put this strategy, implement this strategy in your, strategy in your classroom or implement this strategy in your department. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Implement this strategy in your department. But if you haven't taken the time to do some self-reflection about what your implicit biases may be, I apologize. What your implicit biases may be, then that strategy may not work because let's, and this is an extreme, extreme example, but let's say you are someone that's racist. If I give you a strategy and you haven't really looked into why you feel the way that you feel and you have certain people in your classroom or in your department that represent a group that you do not like or you do not support and you haven't owned that, haven't been transparent about that, you will never be able to implement that strategy in the way that that strategy 
could be implemented and truly reap a benefit in the way that you would want to reap that benefit. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my voice, but we're going to try to get through this anyway. Um, so why does this matter? When you're thinking about that self-reflection piece is really a, to reduce unconscious bias, right? Self-work is a proactive way to address unconscious bias. And by acknowledging and challenging these biases, we can make more equitable decisions and foster a fair and fairer environment, right? When people want to implement things in their classroom or want to implement new policies or procedures, I always challenge them with the why, right? Have you ever created something because one student did a thing and you don't want any ever, one, another student to ever do that thing ever again? Now, nine times out of 10, they probably would never do that thing again, but you want to create this thing or put a clause in your syllabus to make sure just in case Keisha does this thing one more time, Keisha won't be able to do it because I got the other person that did it before, right? So I always challenge people because a lot of times we're, we're implementing things and putting things in place because we think things should operate and function in a certain way based off of our lens and the way that we think about things, but we don't ever really apply that equity lens to it, right? So the others around promoting inclusive behaviors, self-work encourages individuals to reflect on their identity, <clears throat> their behaviors and in interactions. It helps them identify ways to be more inclusive, respectful, and empathetic towards people from diverse backgrounds. So doing that self-reflections gets you to a place where you're going to create more inclusive environments and environments where people belong, right? You have a, a willingness to build that cultural competence. It gets you in a place where you are wanting to continuously learn about other cultures and identities and experiences and how that impact the work that impacts the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing is doing that self-work also gets us to a place to foster a systemic change, right? Because as more individuals commit to self-work, the collective impact can lead to a broader systemic change in the organization. So if we get to a place where we have everyone really doing some self-reflection and thinking about how, who they are and how they show up in their spaces impact student success, faculty and staff retention, things of that nature, it gets us to a place where we change the system, which is something that we ultimately want to do is change the system, even though it starts with us doing our own self-work. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about defining self-work and what are the different things or areas that you might want to think about, look at the first is around emotional intelligence. I think emotional intelligence is something that is important in your personal life and your professional life, whether it is diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, leadership, whatever the space may be, because again, it gives you that space to make sure that you're talking about that self-reflection and that self-awareness piece, right? You're doing the self-management. You're looking at empathy and social awareness. You're thinking about the relationship management of things that if I can't control myself during an uncomfortable conversation, how is that going to impact the relationships I have or the relationships I'm trying to establish as it relates to this work and doing this work? So I think knowing where you sit and stand on the emotional intelligence scale is just as important in any space that you are in. The other is really around challenging your biases. When we talk about challenging our biases, we're diving into the process of self-examination. It's about spotting those prejudices we carry often un, un, um, invisible to us. We're, we don't really know that they're there, but it isn't something that's always comfortable, but it's about unlearning the things that we've been taught, right? We didn't have control over the things that we were taught by our parents or other spaces and environments that we were in, right? And how that has impacted us over time and how it impacts the way that we think about certain populations and certain groups of people. What our job is, is working hard to kind of confront those things and try to shift our thought processes and shift the way that we think about those things. Education, self-work and education go hand in hand. I mentioned this before, it's always an ongoing, ongoing learning process about issues related to diversity and about others. So you taking that time to build your cultural competence and really have an understanding of how other people show up in spaces and why they do show up in the way they show up, which is where that game comes into play, right? The culture wheel game comes into play because it allows you to really understand a little bit more about people and then let that be how you guide your interactions with them. And then ultimately is about 
after you've done that self-reflection, after you've kind of done the things that you need to do to think about what are what I need to shift or change, it puts you in a space of beginning to change and taking accountability, right? This is where the rubber meets the road, taking what we've reflected on, what we've learned and putting it into action. It's about holding ourselves accountable for being part of a place that might not always diverse and inclusive, right? And so how do we, through our own self-work and our own growth, begin to create those spaces that are more inclusive, where people do feel like they belong and where there's more equitable opportunity and where we have those diverse perspectives at the end of the day. So at the end, <clears throat> at the end of your self-work, it really means we are welcoming that feedback and we're using it as a catalyst for change. That whatever we're learning about ourselves ultimately will help us change not only ourselves, but the spaces that we work in. So I mentioned emotional intelligence and I wanna talk a little bit more about it. So emotional intelligence is the ability to make your emotions work for you and not against you. That's my easy way of talking about what that is and kind of what that means. So in the context of DEIB efforts and self-work, you know, self-reflection, self-awareness, those relationships are extremely important, right? So if you think about, if you can't manage your emotions and you don't know what drives you from an emotional perspective, and then you get in a heated conversation about this work, how is that going to impact the work? How is it going to impact the relationship that you have, especially if it's colleagues and people that you're going to work, have to work with on a regular basis? So emotional intelligence and an assessment related to emotional intelligence will really kind of put you in that place. So one of the things that I always ask people, because I'm certified in emotional intelligence, I'm an emotional intelligence coach, I embed that in a lot of work that I do. And one of the things that I always ask people is think about what are your top three strengths, what are your top three weaknesses, and what are your top three triggers? Because from an emotional perspective piece, that's where that self-awareness starts to play a role, right? So what are my strengths? What are those spaces where I'm really strong and I can lead from this space and I can um, utilize those things to make change and have an impact in the space in which I work? Then what are my weaknesses or areas of improvement? What are, what are those things that I know it may be something I need to improve on and, and fix, but sometimes when it comes to weaknesses, it's just knowing that this is an area that you're weak in. So how can I potentially supplement that with a colleague or more education or something of that nature, right? But it's still important for you to understand what your weaknesses are. And then triggers. We need to know what our triggers are. What are going to be those things that trigger us, right? Because I am a true believer that triggers come from traumas that ultimately impact trust, right? So there is something that may have happened at some point in our lives with people um, as we've interacted and engaged with people in the many years that we've been on this earth, right? And so those in those experiences could have been some form of trauma. It may not, we always look at trauma as something big, right? This big thing, they have to be big events that have impacted us. But sometimes it's those very small things, right? Um, one of the things that my employees say to me all the time is, I'm one of those people that I give you freedom and autonomy. You can go out and you can do and create and, and be. And as long as we don't hurt, my rules are. As long as nobody goes to jail, nobody died, and we didn't burn anything down, you can try one time. If it don't work, we'll never do it again. If it does work, great. We've implemented something new that's going to have a positive impact, right? And so I have a lot of people that can't accept that. They struggle with that concept. And the reason why they struggle with it is because they have past trauma. They may not call it trauma, but it's trauma from previous supervisors that have been micromanagers. They had to be in every little thing, had to be a part of every conversation. They couldn't do anything. They didn't have autonomy. So now they're in a space and I'm telling them, hey, you can go forth and do this thing, but that's a trigger for them, right? And ultimately the things that we've experienced are gonna trigger us in our workspaces. And sometimes it impacts how we trust people and how we interact with people. So knowing what your triggers are, especially in this space, when you think about the conversations that we have and the topics that we talk about, what are some of those things that when they come up, they're going to be a trigger for you? And the reason why I tell you to go ahead and think about that, because the idea is the more that you know what those things are, you can put a plan of action. So for me, a trigger for me is in my past history, um, my sons, and I'm always transparent. So I'm a 
give that disclaimer. I'm transparent always in my conversations, but I have a son. He is um, 23, will be 24. And his father, when he and I were together, he always talked over me. Like I never could get a word out. He would never, ever like let me say my piece when it came to our co-parenting. And um, that became a trigger for me. So like when people got to, got to a place that they would talk over me and I, because it was like you were, for me, it was like you were uh, shutting down my voice or my ability to utilize my voice, right? And so I had to recognize that that was past trauma that is a trigger for me and impacts my trust sometimes when I interact and engage with people. But the caveat to that is I need to understand that when people get feel like they want to talk loud or they want to talk over me, I got to take a step back because what I don't want to do is have a negative reaction that is going to jeopardize that relationship later on in my personal or professional space, right? So again, knowing what those things are, especially in this space, what are going to be the topics that you talk about as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging that may trigger you? And if that shows up, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? And sometimes it's not even just about how you're going to respond. It's just being able to be aware enough to know that that is a trigger for me, right? One of the, in the cultural game, I, you know, one of the things was about words and phrases. For me, um, I pick phrases every year, words and phrases every year. And for a, for a couple of years, my, one of my phrases has been say less. And that really has been around say less, listen more is really what that is about, right? And so we need to get to places when we know what a trigger is for us. Sometimes it's just a matter of saying less. We shouldn't respond because if we do respond, it may have a negative reaction or it may negatively impact the work or the goals that we're trying to accomplish in the spaces that we're in. So knowing those things are important. So in thinking about emotional intelligence and just thinking from a personal level, what are the benefits of working on emotional intelligence from a personal level? It gives you a space of having uncomfortable conversations without hurting people's feelings because you're able to manage your own feelings. You are able to recognize the emotions that you may bring out of other people based off of the topics that you're talking about. And then it puts you in a place to have those hard conversations, right? If you think about why this work doesn't work sometimes in our spaces, a lot of times it's because um, we try to sit DEIB work on top of, which is already controversial and, and um, political. We try to sit that on top of leadership sometimes that don't hold people accountable, don't like conflict, don't know how to really manage conflict resolution and don't know how to have how to have comfortable conversations or uncomfortable conversations where in something that's emotionally driven as this topic as this subject you have to be able to have uncomfortable conversations and get to that space right it also allows you to help manage your emotions when you're stressed or feeling overwhelmed. It helps you improve your relationships with the people that you care about because you're able to recognize how your how you respond to things may be impacting them, right? And or it may be able to put you in an empathetic perspective. In the DEIB space, it's the same. It helps you resolve conflict. It helps you coach and motivate others. It helps you create a culture of collaboration and I talked about psychological safety. It helps you get to a space of building that psychological safety. Components of that are self-awareness, which I've kind of mentioned, um, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management, right? Being able to pick up on the mood in the room and being able to hear what other people are saying and understanding their own perspective. Being able, again, to recognize when something that you are saying is bringing about emotion in another person and being able to kind of reflect on that and do a check-in to see what's going on from that space. So what are some things or strategies that you can begin to implement um, as you're thinking about this self-work? Um, another question for you to think about, and I know I have not that much time um, remaining, I have about two more slides, but Think about a time when you realize your own implicit bias. What was the bias related to and what steps have you taken to address it since that re um, realization? So the first thing, I can't say it enough, do self-reflection, do self-reflection, do self-reflection, right? Journaling is a great way. You can reflect on your thoughts and your feelings. One of the things that I stress with folks is sometimes if something happens, I have a, in my office, I have a board right above my computer. 
and I have three things on it. And I look at it when I'm in meetings. This is a good way. This is like DEIB unrelated, but definitely something you can use in this context. But does it have to be said? Does it have to be said now? And does it have to be said by me? Those are three questions that I ask myself when I'm in spaces where I may be triggered or may be in hot topic type of conversations um, or in conversations where I'm trying to foster relationships and build relationships. And what I do in moments when I decide that it doesn't have to be said now or it doesn't have to be said by me, I reflect in my journal later. I may circle back and have that conversation later, but it gives me a process to think about. What are self-assessment tools? You can take the emotional intelligence assessment. There's an inclusive bias inventory that you can take that kind of gives you some self-reflection and tells you those areas where you may need to work on. Actively seek feedback about the way that you interact and engage with people um, and how they feel after they've interacted and engaged with you is important. The next is around building that empathy and that unconscious bias, you know, actively look, listening to people, not listening to reply, but listening to understand and hear what people are saying, do that cultural competence, you slow down. I tell people all the time, you have to slow down in order to speed up. So slow down and reflect as you're having these conversations. How did that make me feel? What were my feelings during that? What were the per what was the intent versus impact in the conversations that I'm having? What are those stereotypes that I'm challenging, right? What are the things that I see within my workspace that I feel like, hey, I need to utilize my voice? And if I utilize my voice, what does that mean, right? So really taking that time. Um, allyship is educating yourself about um, various cultures, amplifying, amplifying your voice when you can, and then intervene, intervening respectfully. So with that, I will stop and ask, does anybody have any questions in these last couple of minutes that we have? Hi, Keisha, my name is Sam Morgan. I'm from California. Um, I reached out to you in the chat. Uh, your, your training is very inspiring and encouraging. Like you, I'm the only um, African-American administrator on my campus. And I, I work with uh, disabled students uh, but also uh, a part of equity movement on my campus. And it is, uh, it's difficult to say the least. So I wanted to reach out to you just to gain some more information and knowledge and what you're doing on your campus so that hopefully I can adopt some of those practices and principles and the approach that you have um, to be more effective here. Okay, I can do that. Um, I will take note of your email and I'll, I'll send, I'll reach out to you. Uh, one of the things that I do um, here in North Carolina is I host the Equity Coach Academy, where I train people uh, across the on how to do this work on their campuses. Um, so I can talk to you a little bit more yeah, kind of about that. I would be interested. I would be interested. Any other you. questions? You're welcome. Anybody has? I do have. If you can give me some feedback, you can scan that QR code, and that will give me some feedback um, on today's session. And then this is my contact information. If you do want some more information, um, this, I saw um, a question about the slides. I think they do share the slides. Um, but if not, you can always reach out to me and I can share the slides with you as well. But I appreciate you all giving me some time. And I'll put the QR code back up so you all. Can you all see it? Oh, the image is not showing. It's showing on my screen, but not on yours. All right, let me see. I'll drop the link in the chat right quick since the, the QR code is not showing. Stop sharing. And Keisha, meanwhile, I would like to use this time to thank you again once more. That was a wonderful speech um, and all the things you said were important, but I would like to um, point out safe and brave space you mentioned at the beginning, because we use this term a lot. And when we use these, term, these two terms a lot, do we really know what we mean and what we mean for other people, what, what, what it means for other people, right? So um, if we are not able to create a safe space, we shouldn't ever say that at all. And it's, I think, very, very important thing to keep in mind. 
Thank you so much. Um, I see that, you know, wonderful comments in the chat. So um, thank you again. And everyone, we have uh, other sessions starting at 1 p.m. And it's going to be understanding and attaining equity in artificial intelligence in higher education. It's going to be in Zoom room, room A, artificial intelligence. We talk about it a lot these days, right? And in this room, we're going to have insights from the CTE CoLab. Strategies for Advancing Racial Equity in Online Post-Secondary CTE. And then um, in room C, we will have social annotation to foster equity and belonging. So hope to see you there. And hopefully you'll be able to use this time to take a break. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, everyone.